Happy Whiskey Wings, everybody. This is the Whiskey Lifestyles Women in Whiskey Series, and I'm your host, Rashawn Hall, aka Bar Time Stories. Have another great interview today. Ironically, I think this is the first person that we've interviewed who had the exact same role as someone we interviewed in season one. So without further ado, I want to introduce uh, Old Forest is a new master taster, Melissa Riff. So thank you so much for being on board. Come Thanks on. for having us on, Rashawn. Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, your predecessor uh, was kind enough to do season one. So I am I am so happy that she is passing the source to you and you are now joining us. So uh, first and foremost, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into whiskey in general. Yeah, I uh, I always say that I have a, a pretty non-traditional background when it comes to bourbon, which I think most everybody you meet kind of in my cohort and above uh, in the industry kind of found their way to it by way of accident and then passion. Um, and I was much the same. So I was actually acting uh, as a family therapist. I, I got my degree in social work with an emphasis in couple and family therapy um, and was practicing here in Louisville. Uh, it's where I got my master's degree. It's where I'm from originally and really had just fallen into bourbon as a hobby um, and found that I had kind of a knack for the storytelling aspect of the bourbon trail. So I thought that I might get a part time job giving tours on the bourbon trail, make some extra cash on the weekends. Uh, and what I started to realize is that there was so much to learn when it came to bourbon. So I really started expanding my knowledge about production, about flavor development, how to taste properly, uh, the history, the legal side of things, the brand marketing side of things. And by the time I really started uh, kind of gathering all this information, I'd really found a passion and, and a career. Um, and from there, I kind of climbed my way on the bourbon trail uh, and eventually launched a single barrel program for the brand I was working for at the time. And I always say that single barrel is the perfect way to kind of discern where you want to go in the industry because it's such a cross-functional role. So I really got access to every single part of that three-tier system, including production, you know, backup house, uh, as well as hosting the folks who are coming to taste and select their barrels. And so that kind of perfectly situated me to step into the role of master taster. And, you know, I obviously wasn't slating towards that for my career but by the time i was able to apply for this role i knew it was exactly what i wanted to do so i i have to ask going from therapy psychology to to whiskey i mean on the one hand there's a, i'm sure there's a lot of upside you can you can read people very well but what do you, what do you, what do you think when you just said hey yeah i yeah, know i had studied i have a map <laughs> however hear me out and I know you're from Kentucky, so that maybe it was a little bit easier of, of a blow. But they, what was that initial thought like? Yeah, it's funny. It's like everyone's favorite punchline when I say that I come from the therapy world. Um, coincidentally enough, you know, Elizabeth McCall over at Woodford also came from clinical psychology. So it obviously has some parallels and some applications in the industry. But um, yeah, you know, I'd gone through undergraduate degree and then my graduate degree, and then I'd gotten into the workforce for a couple of years. So I think it was a little bit of a shock to just deviate so early from the career path that I had chosen. Um, but, you know, I think my family knows that I really try to do things with intentionality. And I think that they could really see how much I was learning and how fast I was really integrating into the industry. Um, and on top of that, you know, I have a twin sister who loves drinking whiskey and cocktails. My dad is kind of big into bourbon. So I don't think they were too upset about the perks that came with my career change either. Um, but yeah, they were fully supportive, just a little confused in the early days. But now that I've landed here, I think they they kind of see the path uh, that I took and, and and how much sense it made for me. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you, you talked about kind of coming into the world uh, of, you know, first via single barrel programs. And I think that's so interesting. We've had a couple of people in previous years in the loop who have either been on single barrel programs or worked in various relationships. Uh, and you even mentioned uh taste select and i always say repeat because uh we have a mutual friend oj lima who uh you, you did a great women's history month like recently so uh yes. congrats on that um tell us a little bit about for those who don't know like what your process and how do you walk i think every i've had the pleasure of being on a couple every process everyone kind of walks through a program differently you know depending on the distillery depending on who is walking you through that program what was that experience how did you walk folks through that when when you're going through that program you know, I had an interesting kind of evolution in single barrel because I started a program fresh. So really, I was hired to be the host of a brand new program, had never been done before. I had never even been on a single barrel pick, I think, for the first year I was running that program at any other brand. So um, I think it worked in my favor a little bit to not really have any expectations or precedent set. What I really tried to do is take my time working in hospitality and tourism 
and kind of translate that to the trade folks that we would be hosting. So really try to elevate the information I was giving on the tour. I wanted them to feel like when they came to take a tour to pick a barrel, they weren't going to get the same tour as they got, you know, taking a public tour. Um, I really tried to amplify the hospitality, give them all the tools to taste at the table. Um, and then I tried to personalize it and make it as custom as possible. So I think that what a lot of people forget when we're talking about single barrels is that uh, I could have my own system for hosting the groups, but everybody comes in with their own system for picking. You know, Taste Select Repeat is a great example. They kind of have a system of going in blind, not sharing any tasting notes in the first kind of pass through, eliminating one just on the blind, uh, you know, right there, and then kind of opening up some conversation. So coming from therapy, we always talk about being people centered, kind of meeting people where they're at. You can have modes and theories that you kind of are informed by, but you can't pigeonhole your clients into those theories. Uh, you have to be pretty flexible to kind of meet people where they're at. And so I tried to take the same approach with single barrels. And this has been the third single barrel program here at Old Forester that I've worked on. And I think just leaving that open-ended space for people to come in and really apply their system. And if they've never done a single barrel pick before, then I have some structure in place to kind of help them do so. But really trying to make it about each and every individual group and make them feel like they're getting a very special, very customized experience has worked really well for me in the past. And I know that uh, obviously the single barrel program is just one part of what you do with Master Taste. So tell us a little bit more about what that role overall uh, encompasses for you. Sure. Yeah, the Master Taster role, especially here at Old Forester, is very much a two-pronged approach. So we've got half of it kind of covering national brand ambassador type role, which I was very ready to step into. I worked in a lot of ambassador type roles before. I've been, you know, on the news and done media. Uh, the one thing I hadn't been able to do was go out and market. So that's been really exciting for me to get my travel going and really get out to meet the people, not just in Kentucky, who are Old Forester enthusiasts. Um, so national brand ambassador, big part of the role, but then the, the master taster side of the role is what I'm really excited to kind of get my hands into and where I'm coming in uh, with a little bit more kind of room to grow. And so that is really working on finished goods, working in collaboration with, uh, you know, Chris Morris, uh, even taking a little bit of education and direction from Elizabeth McCall. She's a wealth of knowledge. Um, our sensory teams, our research and development teams, and really kind of working on future innovations and expressions of Old Forester especially when we talk about our distillery only releases like the 117 series, the president's choice and birthday bourbons. So I'm still, I, I tell everybody I'm very much in training when it comes to being a master taster because I didn't come in with those credentials. Um, it starts off with a lot of education and getting into the quality control paneling with our sensory team. So I'm really in the thick of that right now. Uh, and then eventually getting to work on those, on those expressions of Old Forester. And as someone who I read recently in the Vine Pair article that you were a, a lifelong or a long time, not lifelong, because obviously we go <laughs> a long time uh, Old Forester fan before coming to the brand. Uh, what is it like to now literally, as I was out again doing research, looking at the Old Forester Instagram account and you're all over it. What is it like to literally be the face of, uh, of a brand that you were a fan of and, and one that has such uh, such a rich history? It is a bit surreal, um, especially, yeah, when you go on that social media, it's like my face is everywhere. <laughs> um, I, you know, I've been a long time Old Forester drinker since I came back to Louisville for grad school. And I always tell people Old Forester is kind of like our hometown hero here in Louisville. So it's been really exciting to see how well we're received outside of the state as well. We have so much momentum on a national scale. So that's that's been really fun. Um, I think what's kind of surreal about it to me is I've just had a lot of admiration for the brand and the way that it tells stories and the way that it connects to people. Um, so I feel very fortunate to kind of step into this role and get to kind of put my own spin on things and um, and really be that visible role that I've been trying to get to for a long time, put my skills to the test and really make it my own. And you talked earlier about, I mean, I think this applies to the single barrel program, but I'm sure as as a, uh, as the ambassador now, it's also the thing that when you are talking to talking to folks, whether they're consumers or bartenders, um, what is your, how do you introduce them to Old Forest? I think probably more so for consumers, but how do you tell that introductory, not only story, but what is that expression? If someone says, oh, I've never had Old Forest, or what is, what's the go-to expression, you know, that you would recommend to them? Well, I always start with our story because we have such a good one and we have so much history that we can kind of call back to. You know, we've been around over 150 years. Um, and I always start by saying, you know, we were innovators and disruptors from the very beginning, kind of coming in with this 
uh, value of consumer protection, quality control, first bottle bourbon. Um, and I think that we've continued to leave that charge. We've been first to market for so many things through our tenure, uh, but we've been able to kind of generate this modern relevance as of late. And I think that that's what helps people kind of connect to us today, especially kind of this renaissance of whiskey drinkers that we've seen out in the market. So I always just start by trying to really connect them to the story of our brand and let them know that if you're into history, there's a lot to be had there. But if you're more into what we're doing on the modern frontier, you know, we've got a lot of that going on as well. Um, still kind of leading the charge uh, with with innovation and inclusivity and things like that. And then as far as the expressions I introduce people to, you know, the Old Forester 86 is going to be just a great one for anybody and everybody who wants to try Old Forester because it checks all those boxes. It's approachable enough for people who are just getting into the category. It's complex enough for folks who, you know, have a lot of experience with bourbon and want those more complex flavors. Um, likewise to the 86, the 100 proof I evangelize in any and every bar I ever go to um, because it's such a good expression. Again, neat on the rocks for any type of bourbon drinker, but especially also in that cocktail space because it's really going to stand up to a lot of those mixers. So that's kind of the core expressions. When we're talking about our craft line, like the Whiskey Hero series, uh, the 1870 is one of my favorites, again, because it just kind of amplifies those classic Old Forester flavors, but it has a lot of finesse to it, a lot of balance. It's very accessible and approachable. So when I'm talking to people about just getting introduced to Old Forester, those are usually the three that I stick to. Okay. And uh, you mentioned earlier the 117 series, which is uh, the distillery specialty series, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you just, the most recent release is Warehouse H. Can you tell us a little bit about that and how, how that falls both in the story and as well as kind of in the flavor profile of, of Old Forester? Yeah, absolutely. Warehouse H was such a fun one for me to get to release out to the public. Um, we've had two single warehouse expressions in the 117 series, Warehouse K and then Warehouse H. Um, and when we talk about the 1870 expression in our Whiskey Row series, we talk about how we try to mirror George Garvin Brown's original batching process. So he not having a distillery of his own back in 1870 with source from three different distilleries in the Louisville area. We obviously have our own distillery. We love what we do. And so instead of sourcing, which we don't need to do, we just try to mirror that process with three different warehouses. So we batch barrels from those three warehouses to craft the 1870. Um, and these 117 expressions of the single warehouses are really breakouts from those three. Uh, the warehouse H is unique in that that warehouse has some really funky microclimates going on in it. What a lot of people don't know is that um, our warehouses on our main Brown Foreman site are actually big, long, dual chamber warehouses with huge retention walls in the middle. So we have G and H actually sitting connected to one another. And as the winds come in from the Northwest, they hit a lot of G and they don't always make it into H. So when we're talking about maturation and barrel aging, airflow is a big part of how those microclimates affect the aging of the bourbon. Warehouse eight, sometimes our floor, uh, first floor gets hotter than the rest of the warehouse because of that lack of airflow. So the aging patterns in H can be really interesting. For this 117 series, we pulled just barrels from that first floor, batched them and bottled them at 98 proof. And this one has been a really interesting take on a single warehouse because it just has so much of that nice, sweet citrus note that we know from Old Forester. Um, we kind of pinpointed almost like a lemon meringue or a lemon pie. It has a lot of that really bright, sweet citrus. And then a lot of those confectionery notes like custard and meringue and a little bit of creaminess. Um, and then even a little bit of that roasty toasty note, we said like a graham cracker crust, if you're going with the, with the lemon custard pie uh, metaphor. And so it just kind of uh, connects to this really nice, sweet, desserty, but still very citrus forward expression of Old Forester. And as you said, that's the distillery series. So that's, you can only get at the distillery, which is in, in Volvo on Main Street. Uh, tell us a little bit about the distillery for those who don't, for those who, uh, and, 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 you know, what is it? What's the one thing you'd say if you came to the show? What's the one thing you should you ask them to do a tour? Well, let's, let's say we're going to, it's not, let's go to the you're going to do the tour. What's the key thing or the most uh, interesting thing? in the distillery that, that, you know, you always think about or you share with folks when you're you know, doing walkthroughs or tours or, or, you know, single barrel programs, et cetera. Sure. I'm a, I'm a rule breaker. So I'm going to give you a couple key points. And stuff. Okay. Just, <laughs> uh, yeah. First things first, our distillery sits on Whiskey Row, which is Main Street, downtown Louisville, um, which is historically named Whiskey Row because of all the whiskey businesses pre-prohibition that existed there. We're the only spot that's back in our original location. So when you're in the building, you're literally standing in the site that Old Forester um, house 
from 1882 to 1919. And then almost 100 years later, we launched this tour program here in the same building. So you're actually standing in history when you're here, which I think is such a special thing to get to do. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, not only have we packed like a huge craft distillery into this tall, narrow, skinny little building in a beautifully laid out way, um, but we also have a small craft cooperage inside. And that's because Brown Foreman's the only major supplier that coopers their own barrels. We have a large one here in Louisville and a large one down in Alabama that makes all the barrels for Jack. Uh, but you do actually get to see someone hand coopering barrels when you take our tour. You get to light a barrel on fire, which is everybody's favorite part. Um, so you get to learn a little bit more of that, those kind of ancillary crafts that you don't always get to see on every bourbon tour when you're here on ours. Wow. I had no, I've been, many times I've been, I had no idea that that was the original location. So uh, I think. Oh yeah. Are we doing last year? Either I did know or rem now I, I forgot. But, uh, so which makes it even more interesting that you all recently did this uh, sleep easy uh, Airbnb experience, if you will, within the distillery. Tell, tell folks a little bit about what that very, obviously, very unique opportunity was. The Sleep Easy has been one of the most interesting things I've done in my career so far, and it's been a huge hit with a lot of our really big Old Forester loyalists. Um, so we have a loft uh, right next to the building. It's called Whiskey Row Lofts, and we've leased that loft for several years. We've used it for kind of random things, putting up single barrel groups, media, internal brown foreman visitors. Um, but we wanted to do something... A, with a charity component, and B, where we could really let some big old faux fans access something unique. And so we actually brought in a set designer um, to deck out the loft in kind of a speakeasy Prohibition era vibe. We pulled a lot of prints from our archives uh, when Old Forester was being sold medicinally during Prohibition, um, which is a big part of our history, and um, really decorated it to give that feel. We put it on VRBO for a minimum of three nights at a time. Um, and all of the proceeds from the booking are going to the Center for Women and Families, which is a crisis center and shelter that we have here in Louisville, um, which is a, a charity that's near and dear to my heart. So I was really excited to work with them. And those that do book get a tour at the distillery, um, a happy hour meet and greet with me, which has been really fun getting to know all the folks who've come to stay and then access to buy anything from our distillery only premium line. So those 117s, President's Choice birthday bourbons, uh, which of course everyone's very enthusiastic to have access to. Awesome. So, and that was for the month of March. That was for the month of March. Is that something that you all will continue to do? Or is it, I mean, do you, do you even have, has that even been kind of discussed more broadly? Yeah, we did it for the month of March. We've actually offered uh, the Center for Women and Families the month of April so that they've auctioned off a couple of nights and um, are putting up some donors. So it was nice to be able to give back even more than just the booking fees um, to them. And then it was so popular right when we posted the link that we did open up just a couple of May dates. You know, it's derby season, so we got a lot going on. Um, I think this has been kind of a test and learn for us. So I think we'll recoup after we're done with those last final dates and see uh, what we want to do moving forward. But it has been, it's created a lot of buzz and it's been a huge success. And again, I've just, it's been a pleasure hosting all the folks. Every single one has been different um, and excited and just had nothing but good things to say about their time here. Uh, so yeah, we, you know, uh, we ask everyone, when we started this series, season one, we asked everyone kind of what it's meant to be a woman in whiskey. Uh, got a lot of great answers. Yeah. We want to talk about evolve all the conversation, uh, a little bit more beyond that. So, uh, this season we're asking everyone, what are the piece of advice that you would have given a younger Melissa five years ago? What's something that you know now, you know, particularly in the, maybe in the whiskey states, but if not, then not, uh, that you would, that you would share with yourself that you would think would, would, would help her or another another person who is in in some way is ready to know and do better i love that question um you know we get a lot of questions about what's it like being a woman in a male-dominated field and you know i have some answers to that but i really appreciate this question of just what advice would you give because i think five years ago that's what i was looking for right just advice and so that i would say mentorship is a huge part of career development I think a lot of people, um, they get kind of continuing education and training and the importance of those things. Um, but I think a lot of folks, especially when they're kind of out actively looking for, for jobs and opportunities, can feel a little bit alone and, you know, blown in the wind. And so when I really started to see my career evolve was when I really actively sought out mentorship from specifically other women in the industry. 
And in addition to that, when I really started to see some upward mobility for myself, I really tried to take on at least one mentee. So my advice that I always try to give to people, especially women in the industry, is find yourself a mentor, be intentional about meeting with them, even if it's once a month for a cup of coffee and just finding out how you can continue to develop. And then when you do see some success, really make sure that you take on a mentee so that we can keep lifting each other up. Perfect. That is that. I couldn't have asked for a better answer. <laughs> uh, so lastly, we always like to end on a, on a fun note. Uh, I think you, everyone knows this question. It's a, it's a pretty standard question, but if you could have a whiskey, and I'm not going to ask you, I was going to initially ask you to say, what's your, what, what is your favorite old forester expression? I'm not going to put you on a spot like that. I'm just going to say it, whatever that expression is, uh, if you could have it with one person dead or alive, celebrity, friend, whoever that might be, who would it be and why? Um, I always give different answers to this question so I can cheat the system and have drinks with <laughs> lots of famous people. Um, but recently it's been on my mind a lot. And I've said this a couple of times as an answer before, uh, Marsha P. Johnson, um, huge advocate in the LGBTQ space back in the civil rights movement, um, kind of credited with kicking off the Stonewall riots, although that was a large group of people, um, that did so, but her resilience in the activism space, you know, activism is a big part of my life outside of work, um, has just been really inspiring. A lot of people don't know, but the P um, in Marsha P. Johnson stands for pay then no mind, which I've just always thought is a beautiful mantra for marginalized communities to just be able to let some stuff roll off your back and really find those points that make a difference um, to make change. And so if I could have a pour of whiskey with Martha P. Martha P. Johnson, that would be amazing awesome. well, Melissa thank you so much uh, I look forward to hopefully one day having a pour with you uh, well, I think you're amazing and I appreciate you giving us uh, your time today That was a, it's been uh, amazing to talk with you and learn so much about your very unique trajectory I think you know I'm just like I had no idea that and now I know I didn't know Elizabeth Paul also took that path so thank you so much for your time and, and sharing that with us uh, so yeah so cheers thank you nice to meet you